Hello, my name is Heidi Parks, and this is my solo show exhibition at the Lee Yaki Woodson Art Museum in Wausau, Wisconsin. I'm a Milwaukee artist, and I have been here for a week-long artist residency, and I'm gonna give you a tour of the exhibition so that you can see all of my quilts in the show. We can begin by taking a quick little space been around the gallery space to give you a sense of the space itself, the scope of the room in the museum. And we can begin over here at the title for the exhibition. So here the show is Heidi Parks, Reuse, Reflection, and Storytelling in Cloth. This first quilt is one that I made using a skirt of mine that no longer fit, and even if it did, I wouldn't have wanted to wear it again anyways. It's a yellow polka dot skirt over here, and I was exploring the idea of who was past Heidi who wore that skirt, who was the past Heidi who uh, thought that that was a good fit. And at the time I was a high school art teacher in Illinois, in Naperville, Illinois. The skirt was from Ann Taylor Loft. And um, I also was using some fabric that I bought in 2015 when I was in Seoul in South Korea. And it was a traditional bojagi fabric. The silk here, that's pink, yellow, and white, has a clear effect, but it's a white silk, are all fabrics that I purchased and then tucked safely away for the day when I could use them. I believe that I made this quilt, uh, finished it in 2018, and it was in on exhibition at the Modern Quilt Guild's Quilt Con in Nashville, probably in 2019. And there it received a Judge's Choice Award from Mondo Guerrero from Project Runway. So it was a very exciting moment for the quilt. I'll bring you in to see it a little closer and explain a few extra details. So here you can see the polka dot of the skirt. And this is a ribbon that was inset as the waistband of the skirt. Here's a little spot where I patched to cover where the zipper had been. I wrapped some string around my waist to find my waist size, uh, not compressed, <laughs> this was always a small skirt. And, and so this is current Heidi, 2018 Heidi, and this was the version of my waist that was squished into that skirt when I used to wear it. So it was the beginning of a dialogue of past and present Heidi and thinking about the resources that I had access to. I allowed a lot of the thread tails to be very long here and I liked the idea that I was creating a bit of an archeological dig for the viewer that they might be able to tell that this is where I ran out of thread and this is where I chose to stop because of the composition. I also have a lot of visible piecing here, so you can see the thread tails underneath the organza. And you can see a lot of the thread tails underneath the whip stitch here. You can see the seaming. The binding is particularly special on this quilt. You can see the way that I have all of my knots hidden and tucked away underneath that part of the quilt. We'll move on to a quilt that's part of the same series about memory and looking back. This piece from 2017 is called But I Tried to Remember. And it is similarly made with transparent fabrics. There's a scrim across the entire top of the quilt in this uh, this section, there's some silk chiffon. Below it is some very inexpensive repurposed polyester window curtain. And here is some open weave cotton pocketing. It creates a warmer veil and more transparent with this luxurious material and a cooler look 
underneath the cotton, and then quite a bit more opacity with the silk, or sorry, with the polyester here at the bottom. There are a lot of pieces of fabric that are initially stuck to the batting. Batting is a sticky substance. It's often used to create a design wall in a quilter's studio if you work vertically. I typically work flat on the floor and that's how I made this quilt as well. So I assembled and composed the quilt by laying down the backing and then the batting. And then I took all these little tiny pieces of fabric or sometimes rather large boxes of fabric and placed them on top of the batting. When I liked the composition, I pieced all three pieces of fabric for the scrim and placed that on top. You can zoom in and you'll be able to see some of the knots on this quilt. They're really very abundant. There's a great texture that they create. It's a lot of fun to look at this quilt from a slight angle to see the three-dimensionality of some of those knots. This quilt, again, has a connection to that trip that I took to Seoul in 2015. The seam here is pieced in a traditional Korean patchwork approach of using the whip stitch and stabbing straight through so that it creates a visible line. That time that I spent learning um, over two weeks in Seoul inspired me a great deal to do visible hand piecing. When I made this quilt, I was at a moment in my arc as a quilter. I began quil quilting in 2013 with fabric and at the time I did a lot of piecing with a sewing machine. In 2015, I was starting to notice that I would get some low back pain and my ears didn't love the sound of the sewing machine. And so I think I was keen to start to find a way to shift my practice from machine piecing and hand quilting to specifically handwork, but I was very afraid that it would take too long, that I, wouldn't, that I would maybe only make one quilt a year, that the quilts would become uh, shockingly expensive and laborious to make, which I did not want. So this quilt was me dipping my toe into that idea that maybe I didn't have to hand piece the entire composition. I could lay it underneath the scrim, do just a small amount of visible hand piecing, the Korean patchwork whip stitch, and then I quilted everything in place. The quilt is called But I Tried to Remember, and I made it for the Piecework Collective exhibition in New York in the Chelsea neighborhood. It was an exhibition of quilts, and we collectively chose the theme of color. So this was me making a colorful quilt, and it was a lot of fun to then mute the colors by putting them underneath that silk scrim. It was a quilt that I made looking back at the five year anniversary of having ended a 10 year relationship. According to Sex and the City, a very New York TV show, um, you have half the time of the relationship to get over the relationship. So I was very curious to see what did it feel like to meet that benchmark with moving on and moving forward in my life. There are a lot of large squares that to me represented facts that were indisputable about the relationship. Um, for example, where we lived or how many years we were together. And then there were a lot of things that were blurry and that would change depending on how I told the story. Um, it was the best of times and the worst of times is what I would have said at the time and that Depending on the angle or the mood, I could tell a different story. Recently, thanks to YouTube and Dr. Romani, I've realized that that was a uh, relationship that was very characterized by narcissistic abuse. I often dismissed it as being a relationship with a lawyer and that it was his natural way to want to win me over. But <clears throat> um, in looking back and exploring that relationship now, 10 years out from it, I'm able to see with clearer eyes what was happening and some of the potentially very therapeutic benefits that I had from making this quilt of understanding 
that disorientation that I have. I also notice in this quilt that none of the pieces of fabric are touching each other. There's no overlapping of those colorful pieces. And to me, I think that's representative of the clear space that I had between myself and my ex-partner, that we were no longer engaged with each other, we were very separate, and the state of those fabrics not overlapping helps to add to that, as well as the transparent scrim feeling very much like a window into the past, the fogginess of memory. Part of why I chose the word remember in the title is because of Marcel Proust and Remembrance of Things Past. That uh, book was incredibly helpful to me when I read it in 2013 as an audiobook, all 40 CDs. And uh, for me, it made me think a lot about the lens that I use when I am looking at the past or looking at a person, the way that they might be uh, distorted by my memories of them or by my love and affection for a particular person. And that wondering about what is it to be clear-eyed in looking at something versus um, seeing it very, very foggily, which of course is perhaps another symptom of that narcissistic abuse and having a lot of gaslighting and being told that my reality, my perception was not what was happening. So a very, very interesting piece to grow with and to see change over time. Another very large quilt, both of these are about seven feet by seven feet. This is a travel diary quilt that I made when I traveled to India in 2019, at the end of the year in October and September. It's called A Breath Has Four Parts, and that's a nod to a yoga understanding of an inhale, a pause to transition, an exhale, and again, a pause to transition. I am a certified yoga instructor and yoga therapist. I trained in Vinyasa Flow with Ralph Gates and then in yoga therapy with Indu Aurora. And my teacher, Indu Aurora, whose business is called Yoga Sadhana, led a two week tour to India that I went on. And then I added an extra week to my time in India to visit my friend from college, Jyotika Purwar. So these two bags are from Yoga Sadhana and they're bags that my teacher provided to me, friend and teacher. Um, I got to see some block printing while I was traveling in India, in Mumbai with Jyotika. And this is the bag that the block printing arrived in. And there are several examples of the silk and cotton that was block printed. When I was traveling, I also bought some jewelry and I put those fabric bags of jewelry onto the quilt. When I began, I was thinking about very practical concerns. And uh, for me, I think I chose a very large base fabric seven feet by seven feet because of the bigness of that dream to go to India. I'd been wanting to travel on that trip with Indu for about six years and I either couldn't go in the spring or fall because I was a high school art teacher or I couldn't afford to go because I had left my job as a high school art teacher in 2014 to become a professional quilter and my finances just weren't in a state that I could travel in that way. In 2018, my father passed away in June, um, the day after Father's Day, and because he was 69 years old, I inherited some money from him and that allowed me financially to go to India. And so there's a lot of emotional weight around that. It's now five years since my dad passed away and certainly uh, looking at this quilt still makes me feel that bittersweet feeling of missing him, but also some of the solace that I found in him being with his ancestors and doing what people are all meant to do. A very special detail in this quilt as we get a little closer is that there are a lot of fan shapes and I knew India would be hot. And so I, I brought a fan with me and the only fan I had was from my great grandmother on my mom's side. 
and we were in a cave in Rishikesh that is specific to the ancestors and for me getting to connect with that and realizing that I happen to have brought something from my great grandma um, that she bought when she was traveling abroad felt very special. And so that link to the ancestors that's showing up in this fan shape started to become very special. Here you can see a nice close-up as well of some of these jewelry bags. So I took apart and opened up. There's a tea bag, another jewelry bag from the same place. This is a jewelry bag from a very chic shop in Mumbai. This is some of the block printing. From that practical point of view though, when I began, I was thinking about the bigness of the dream of going to India and learning and making a quilt while I was there. And so it felt appropriate to make a very big quilt to honor my dad, to think about both the ties to quilting and camphor quilting and my curiosity about cotton and dye, as well as my interest in yoga to be able to go there. Once I had the size of the quilt, I also thought that using a single piece of base fabric would be very appropriate. That way I could use my embroidery hoop and applique to the different, um, use my hoop to applique lots of different pieces to the quilt without worrying about if things were laying flat. And then I also didn't have to keep track of lots of small bits of patchwork and piecing. I was instead able to add things one by one to the quilt top as I worked. Now, diary quilting is a, and travel diary quilting is a very important part of my work. Uh, in two months, in September of 2023, I will be teaching in France a diary quilting class. And right now I have sales available for a diary quilting class in spring of 2024 to go with me either to Japan or to England. And I'm very excited about bringing those ideas of travel diary quilting to students, talking about ways to document a trip that go beyond a scrapbook and taking photographs, uh, certainly inspired by the idea of a written travel diary, and also thinking very deeply about how do we make a quilt inspired by a place where we don't live and navigate some of the ideas around cultural appropriation, right? How am I not saying that this is my way of working that I invented, but instead adding and paying homage so that people are perhaps learning more expansively about things like Korean patchwork when I went to Korea, things like Kampha and the different traditions of natural dye, for example, that are in India that I got to experience. Um, I also like to incorporate into a travel diary quilt the idea of the longing to go on the trip, the anticipation of travel, as well as the present moment doing some stitching while there and working with rather than fighting against the circumstances. So that for me was in this top quadrant of the quilt just making things that were small in my embroidery hoop and not trying to spread out or dominate any of the spaces that I was in while traveling. And then finally, reminiscing about the trip and the memories when I returned home. It gave me an opportunity to unpack and think about the different things that I learned about rather than getting swept up in the next thing. The bottom corner of the quilt and the left, the depending on where one is. Um, anyways, this side, when I look at it, the right side of the quilt are things that I worked on upon returning home. And so you can tell that very much because I did spread out. I laid large pieces of fabric on the quilt. And here, for example, I have a pillowcase that I purchased in Rishikesh that is in the top corner of the quilt. Here is the shopping bag, and so you can see Prachin is the brand, hand block prints, info at prachin.com. Really um, you know, effortlessly adding to that story and sharing where I got pieces and how someone else might even be able to visit a similar place if they were to travel. This is one of my favorite details, this calendar page. You can see it says calendar here at the bottom. 
I took that as an opportunity to add a calendar of the three weeks when I was in India. So I flew on Thursdays and here I stuffed that with Trapunto made from some of the thread scraps. I became very aware or at least more aware of the impact of pollution and economy and especially air quality when I was in India. My lungs hurt for about five weeks after I got home because of the air pollution, in particular in, particular in the north in Rishikesh and in Mumbai. And that is part of why I titled the quilt. A breath has four parts as well, thinking about the lungs. And especially having just experienced some of the fire smoke in America from the fires that are happening in Canada and as temperature change is causing a lot of different weather circumstances. It was in India my first experience of looking at that map of weather quality, but now that's become something that I have to do more often in my own home in Milwaukee, Wisconsin as well. And being more aware of the global impact of that kind of thing and how important and impactful it is for everyone on earth is one of the many things that I learned while I was traveling and making this quilt. This quilt is three feet by three feet and it is stretched on a wooden frame. It is called But What Was It Like? made in 2018. You can see the frame there. It has a lot of scraps in it. This is a quilt that I made very much inspired by By, by, by a couple of dates that I went on. And, and so I went out with someone for two dates and I was game for another one and he was not so much. And so here, I didn't realize until I saw this quilt and, but I tried to remember in exhibitions side by side when I was a finalist for the Fister Artist Residency. But that's when it came through for me and I, I truly understood more about I didn't overlap any of the fabrics in that previous quilt about a past event, but this quilt has a lot of overlapping going on because it was a relatively recent event. Um, again, on YouTube and Dating World, I've been very inspired by Matthew Hussey, and some of his advice is when you're trying to decide, do you pine after unrequited love or do you move on? <laughs> that the top thing I'm looking for in a partner is someone who wants to be with me. And I used this quilt as a way of letting go of that person I went on two dates with and reframing, creating some new neural pathways in my mind about where I wanted to go in the future and the kind of person that I wanted to partner with. A big part of how I did that was thinking about scraps. This is one of the first quilts that I made that had a true abundance of both fabric scraps. You can see them underneath this silk organza. Very, very small fabric scraps. As well as, for the very first time, these are my thread scraps. So here, lots of bits of scraps. I had been storing them in a ball jar for about a year, not knowing what to do with them or how to incorporate them. And for me, adding the scraps to the quilt was a way of saying, I'm not going to settle for scraps of affection from someone else or scraps of their time, scraps of their interest. I want someone who is wholeheartedly interested in me. And so in many cases, especially in a quilt that is more self-reflective and therapeutic, it can be that microcosm and also a way to perhaps perform an exorcism, get it out of me into the quilt so that I can move on. So there is a fair amount of rumination in my work, thinking back about past things, but it's very much, for me at least, a way of letting go, getting it out of me, out of my head, into the work, and then move on to the next piece. Another quilt that was very healing for me in a different way is this piece. I made it for an exhibition called Threads of Resistance and it was in, uh, in 2017. It was a response to the 2016 election and Threads of Resistance was a call for art about the election. Um, as I saw people preparing for the exhibition, a lot of them looked very much like 
posters for the Women's March, which I went to with my dad and had an amazing time. I was very glad to participate there. But for the exhibition, I was hoping to make something a little more nuanced that touched on the grief that I felt rather than taking a hard stance and, and perhaps driving two sides further apart. As I talked about the exhibition and thought about what would I make in this call for, call for entry, the more I talked about it, the more I felt that most of my friends had loved ones who had voted on the other side and that this other side, people who voted for, for Trump, were not mysterious figures, but in fact were people that I loved very much, people that my friends loved very much, and people who we loved back. So this, for example, then became a quilt centered on my mother. And my dad voted the way that I did, my mom voted opposite, and I was able to bring some, some greater lines of communication into my family with this quilt, as well as uh, to think about the deep grief that I felt. So here, this is the very first quilt that I made with this transparent scrim. This is an Ikea curtain. Underneath it is a lot of unfurled thread. And on top here at the bottom are knots. So it's a tied quilt at the bottom. It's quilted with the running stitch at the top and it has less thread underneath the curtain. Here at the top, you can see the rungs that might have gone through my curtain rod. And then to go over top that, so it wasn't loose, I put the, I put the curtain on its side. So here along the side is the bottom of the curtain. So this would have been the bottom moving towards the middle of the curtain over here. And in, it says here with an arrow, you can see these stitches. Right here, my mom hemmed these curtains for me in 2013. And it's highlighting that this article that I began with, this curtain, is a document of my mother's love for me, a reminder of that when I was feeling quite unloved, uncared for, because I was worried about the impact on my health care, the impact on a lot of friends that I have, and it's been very sad in the last years since this happened to see, especially as a Wisconsinite, a lot of my health care um, access being denied to me, as well as many other changes that have taken place. But um, one of the things that I love most about this quilt it was in Austin, Texas in 2020. It received first place for handwork in that uh, Modern Quilt Guild's Quilt Con exhibition, as well as just seeing and interacting with people here in the gallery is the, the way that it can tug at people's heartstrings and not just for people who are Democrats like me, but people on both sides of the aisle feel that pain and loss and grief around having um, a loved one whose politics they can't understand. And the divisiveness of politics today contrasted with uh, perhaps 20 years ago, I'm 40, so when I was 20 and first able to vote, that there was a, uh, it didn't feel as divisive. It didn't feel like as much of a betrayal to vote in the opposite way. It felt like a couple options that could both be good directions, potentially. So uh, this quilt, again, the thing that I love most about it is that it seems to touch people's hearts and that it gets photographed and mailed to loved ones quite often. And I'm also forever grateful to this quilt for allowing my mother and I to talk more to open the lines of communication between us because that sudden refusal to discuss politics because we didn't agree was very painful after a lifetime of growing up and being able to talk to my mother about politics. This is another family quilt. This quilt is one that I made with my four-year-old nephew, Colin. He 
and I worked on the composition together. Also below me, you can see a lot of vases that I've made. Those are an environmentally friendly project where I'm taking glass from my recycling bin, wrapping my batting scraps around it, and then I'm making a vase. So here you can see a small example of my vase and the glass on the inside. This piece that I made with my nephew, he lives in Madison and on their way up to Manaqua for the 4th of July, they got to be in this gallery and see the quilt. My younger nephew, his favorite one was the one that I made when I was in India. And of course, Colin, who contributed to this quilt, was um, so overjoyed to see it on display. This is the fifth time that this quilt has been on exhibition. <clears throat> It was initially something that I made because of the a request to make it. Um, trying to get a better angle, there we go. So I was invited to be in this exhibition. It was in Seoul, in South Korea, and the, um, let's see. My friend Youngmin Lee, who makes bojagis and does a lot of traditional Korean patchwork in San Francisco, she was involved with a space called Okamoka in Seoul. And Okamoka makes fabric and designs it. And especially on the back of this quilt, there's a lot of beautiful prints that she's designed. She has a deep desire to make work that spreads joy, that is joyful and very colorful. And she invited an international group of artists who were interested in Bajagi and, 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 and the, the quilts in South Korea to participate. So Young Min Lee and I were both the participants from America. There were also participants in Japan and France. Um, I forget if there was someone in England. It was a relatively small group of us, but very international when we would meet on Zoom. Someone was always awake at a time when they shouldn't have been awake, which was really a lot of fun. The project was called the Double Happiness Project, and it centered around the scraps that they had at Okamoka from teaching workshops or doing things. And then there's a little piece of fabric left, not as big as a fat quarter, for example, that they could sell. What to do with this beautiful fabric? So they mailed the scraps to all of us. And in the Double Happiness Project, we talked about collaborating and trying to do something up uplifting during the pandemic. Because of the title Double Happiness, it felt quite important to me to involve my nephew. At the time, I was on occasion going for a week to stay with him and his family and babysit um, my brother and my sister-in-law when they had some more intense duties at their jobs and they needed some extra help from extended family to, to help watch the kiddos. So this was partly a solution to keep, uh, to keep them entertained, but also a deep desire to collaborate and to think about what double happiness meant. We did a lot of play. Again, you might be able to guess this is with the tr transparent scrim. I used, again, the bajagi fabric that I bought when I was in Korea and laid down the backing that I hand pieced with the printed, with the prints from Okamoka. Then we laid down the batting layer and I was inspired by those prints to cut out a variety of shapes and those shapes were cut out again of the scraps and fabric that were sent to me by Okamoka. They gave me both solids and prints. So the solids got cut up and then I engaged in a lot of play with Colin. We were able to begin by making a pepperoni pizza in this section of the quilt. And we used a lot of Super Mario Brothers stuffed animals. So Tanuki Mario played a very important role as did the shell, the blue sh spiky shell. We wrapped them up in this big, long blue thread and then had, had some bungee jumping, bungee jumping happening as well as the 
gridded fabric, that m mesh that I made, we pretended that Peter Rabbit and his gooseberry net that he got trapped in was interrupting Mario and they were getting stuck and then had to be freed. And it was a very joyful process to make this quilt. It has since been on display in QuiltCon, the Modern Quilt Guild's quilt conference, as well as the Iowa Quilt Museum in a show curated by Heather Kinian. It was in the Great Wisconsin Quilt Show in Madison, Wisconsin. That's the first time Colin got to see it on display. And now here. This quilt is from a pattern that I wrote. Let's see, maybe we can get both of these quilts in here. <clears throat> so this quilt is Vignettes Quilt number one, also made in 2021. It's a pattern that I wrote that inspires and prompts folks to make a block first for the elements of art, form, line, shape, value, etc., and to give them familiarity with the elements of art. Then we move on to the postmodern principles of art, which were written about in a wonderful essay by Olivia Good, uh, who I learned about at the School of the Art Institute when I was studying there. And that goes through things like appropriation, recontextualization, juxtaposition, gazing, layering, uh, obsession. I think I might have added that one because it's such a favorite of mine in the postmodern details. But um, anyhow, once you have blocks inspired by both the postmodern principles of art and the elements of art, then we use the principles of design to assemble the quilt. And it's pieced in a way that I call vignettes style piecing because you're making blocks, but they can be any shape, any size, and then you have to figure out how to piece them together. One of the parts that's particularly fun piecing is this orange peel print. This is a apron that had a stain on it that I got at the annual rummage at the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Art. You can see the perimeter of that piece jogs up and down and then swoops way down. And there are a lot of fun piecing techniques that I used for that. A, a nice example of recontextualization is this handkerchief. It's now a quilt in the context of here, but it was originally a handkerchief. This is an embroidery that I did of myself when I was a high school art teacher. And this is the gazing block or vignette in the quilt. You can see my gaze is meeting the gaze of this chicken that's quite likely from the text prompt in the postmodern principles to incorporate text. So that's a feed sack for just right egg mash for chickens. And again, I got that at the annual Quilt Museum rummage as well. It's been a very fun pattern for helping people use the things that they already have uh, and kind of bust through those blocks or those little bits of things that, that you have lurking around. This is also a vignettes quilt. This is vignettes quilt number two. So I made it with the same pattern. This one I made when I was doing a quilt along and you can see a lot of my process for that in the vignettes quilt along series here on my YouTube channel. This quilt, for example, instead of using a handkerchief for, to recontextualize, I used an adult diaper from Japan. I also used this child's diaper from Japan. My friend Takako went to Japan and offered to give me space in her suitcase on her way home. So she purchased a lot of special items for me and brought them back. Now it's Takako that I'm pairing up with to teach in Japan in 2024 in the spring and I'm so excited to be collaborating with her again in connection to Japan. But the first step in that friendship and the feeling of collaboration 
was her bringing back these really amazing items and feeling like she knew me so well that of course Heidi would want a fabric adult diaper to put in a quilt. There are some other interesting items in this quilt. One is a shirt. Um, my partner Bo, I've been with him for over three years now, he and I cleaned out it's a property a real estate investor and house flipper sometimes and so we cleaned out a space that he had purchased and it had a lot of shirts in it so I washed all those shirts and one day I'll incorporate more of them in my work but this was the first of the first bit of something from Bo and from his work that made it into my quilt so here you can see the buttons from that shirt also there's a tea towel here and this is from a collaborative class that I got to participate in with my friend Zach Foster. Zach Foster lives in Brooklyn, New York. He's a very dear friend of mine. I was recently a guest on his podcast series called Seam Side. We did a special episode series called Free Advice where folks asked us for advice and we gave it. I actually shared about that collaborative quilt with Colin, my nephew, uh, very recently when people were asking the question of how to engage young people in quilt meet making. So uh, this piece was from a prompt that we did with the Makery and something that we were doing in the pandemic called a playful pause. Zach led everyone through sewing without looking and we all used either just a piece of fabric or fabric and an embroidery hoop and we tried to embroider our names without looking at the fabric at all. And then during that same class, I offered some hand yoga. And those have two beautiful connections to my residency here at Woodson. We've had a lot of free and accessible programming as well as I taught a class on the vases yesterday. And here um, I've done a lot of hand yoga drop-in sessions for people and we've had an incredible response for the community. A lot of people coming and doing hand yoga with me, which is one of my favorite ways to keep my expertise in, excuse me, in yoga therapy alive and well. I also had the very, very special opportunity to participate in Woodson's programming called Art Beyond Sight. So here on Saturday, two days ago, I got to teach and share my work with a group of people who have some visual impairment and in Art Beyond Sight, they bring in the artist in residence or different artists every month to share something special with that group of students. And I led everyone in sewing and partly my experience with Zach Foster and sewing without looking was part of what led me to believe that I would be able to teach that and gave me the confidence to share the real materials that I truly use with those students. So we used milliner's needles, the same as I always use, DMC pearl cotton, same as I always use. Um, not here, this is a tied quilt with yarn, but that is my preferred material. And it was truly amazing and so special to get to teach that class and to have the museum facilitate that kind of learning for people. So I'll bring you closer so you can see that that embroidery. This is the very first time that I was quilt embroidering without looking at the fabric. Here's the gazing prompt on the quilt. And you can also see that I made it a tied quilt. So it's, it's added a wonderful texture to the piece. I found that it was very dark and it needed some additional visual movement. And I think that the ties in that quilt helped to create that for me. This piece underneath my name and the title of the show is called Remembering and Forgetting. It's a piece that I was inspired to make because of my friend, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> because of my friend Kyrie Carpenter. She works with a group called Changing Aging. And I made this quilt in 2016, and then it went on tour with her. And we were talking about especially the idea of restraining aging and how people are very often encouraged to restrain aging from a very young age. So for example, here, these are tights 
not only are they tights, but they're very tight control top pantyhose, which I know as a yoga therapist is very unpleasant, very bad for the digestive system. So causing ill health by trying to look younger or look different somehow. There are a lot of, this is also the only quilt that I've ever machine quilted. I actually broke a sewing machine doing that, which did help nudge me into those whole cloth quilts and, and to get away from the sewing machine a little more. Um, here I have some hospital restraints that Kyrie gave me to incorporate. This is made on a hospital blanket that she gave me. And as my own grandmother, Mimi, has been aging and experiencing dementia for the last few years, it's been some very helpful information for me to understand how wonderful the caregiving that she has access to is now. They, they have their own Instagram account, and it's so nice to see video of my grandma from time to time on their social media and they spend time painting and doing watercolor. They also have a lot of sound, so they bring in live musicians to perform. Here I incorporated some earbuds and headphones on the quilt to help signify that. They also have good access to the outdoors, so here you can see I've got some grass embroidered on the quilt, and it's it, the process of making this quilt and learning more about dementia before my grandmother was experiencing it so fully was very helpful in finding acceptance of that transition and, and an attempt to see more of the joy and getting to know my new version of my grandmother. I think that that's something that I also learned a lot from Marcel Proust and Remembrance of Things Past. He is so in love with Albertine in the book, the narrator is, and he talks about Albertine by the beach and Albertine in Paris, Albertine with her friends, Albertine on her horse, Albertine wearing her beret. And every day he gets to wake up and meet a new, <clears throat> and meet a new version of Albertine. And the beauty of that, staying curious about who people are. In this instance, it's his partner, you see that extend to his beloved grandmother in the book as well. And for me, <clears throat> a curiosity about who am I, and, and for example, the, the first quilt that I started sharing with you, Heidi from the past, Heidi from now, the juxtaposition of those two, is very inspired by Albertine and Remembrance of Things Past. So you can see that echoing throughout many of my quilts. Um, and here, who is this new grandmother of mine? It's fascinating. She uh, is such an important part of why I became a quilter. She organized a baby quilt for me before I was born and acquired a quilt top at a rummage sale that she never did anything with. And then I inherited it and did something with it in 2013. And that's when I fell in love with quilting and nine months later quit my job to become a professional quilter. So. My grandma Mimi is just so important to me, such a huge part of why I have the career that I have, why I had the courage and interest to pursue art in the first place. She has a degree in art from the Milwaukee, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and she lived in Santa Fe, New Mexico for a decade, and I made a quilt titled Mimi 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 that is not in this exhibition. It's currently at Quilt National at the Dairy, Bar Dairy Barn in Athens, Ohio. And that piece is, is a, another very important piece connected to my grandma Mimi. Uh, so I recently finally got to see her because the things have opened up enough. I flew down to Florida to visit my mother and my grandmother and we were outside in the courtyard and was telling her about quilts and I brought a quilt to show her in person and reminded her that she had made some quilts for me that were very important. And she said, I made a quilt? Imagine that. And that the practice that I have with quilting of trying to stay curious and wondering about things is part of why I can perhaps see a little bit of the joy in that. Certainly there is sorrow too, but what a fascinating new phase for my grandmother. She's kind of in a liminal space between worlds as she will eventually be joining the ancestors with my dad.
Another piece that is very much about looking skyward is this piece called, I know the stars are there beyond the clouds. And I've allowed the quilt to pool at the bottom. If on my YouTube channel, you've seen my tour of the Seams exhibition at the Portrait Society Gallery in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, that I co-curated with Deborah Bremer. That's the first time that this quilt was displayed vertically rather than horizontally. I initially conceived of it as something that was 11 feet wide by five and a half feet tall. I was inspired by Monet's lily pads. And the more I experienced and engaged and worked with this quilt, the more I realized I wanted that feeling of looking up at the sky and also the pooling and cloud-like way that the quilt does fall at the bottom of, of the floor um, in this very voluminous way. I really enjoy the way that this particular exhibition, rather than pooling on the floor, they've built this uh, pedestal that the bottom of the quilt is on. This series is the very first time that I incorporated some of the techniques of Korean patchwork into my own work. I began this series nine months after returning home from Seoul in South Korea. And here you can see the visible hand piecing with the whip stitch. This quilt also incorporates bed sheets. Here you can see the edge of a bed sheet. And that for me connects with the idea of the unconscious mind, the sleeping mind. I was inspired to incorporate that idea by Harville Hendricks and his book, Getting the Love You Want. My therapist that I started seeing after that big breakup of mine, the 10 year relationship, she recommended that book and it was wonderful to talk it through with her. And there are so many incredible insights and valuable skills that I got, including the idea that just because a relationship has ended doesn't mean everything about it was bad or that you're a failure. And it went on to say that there are a lot of unconscious reasons why you choose the partners that you choose. And he made this beautiful analogy about the unconscious being as expansive as the stars in the sky. And he reminds us that the stars don't come out at night but the stars are always there the unconscious mind is always there acting and doing things and he says it is infinitely abundant the same way that maybe during the day you can just see the moon but actually at night you can see a lot of stars and if it's a new moon you can see even more stars and if you come up north like where i am here or even further north in wisconsin to madeline island or Manaqua, that you can see lots of stars and then what if you involve a telescope and that is how potent and important and powerful the unconscious is especially in relationships and so for me i wanted to drive home that idea that the stars don't come out, the stars are always there. Whether you're looking at a blue sky or in this case, for example, a white cloudy sky. So there are, I believe, eight pieces in this series. And this is called, I Know the Stars Are There Beyond the Sky. There are three quilts left. We'll see if we can get it in in an hour. Maybe, maybe not. This is a quilt that I made when I was co-teaching with my friend Zach Foster, who I already mentioned. And we were driving up to teach in northern Wisconsin at Madeline Island. While he was driving, I practiced some embroidering without looking. We also had a big conversation in the car about how I have floaters in my eyes. So since 2019, these little tiny specks of black are in my vision and they caused me a lot of distress because I was worried every time I saw them that they were a mosquito. And then I noticed them more and more because I kept thinking that they were dangerous. And I was talking through with him in the car ride up as well as uh, before that with my doctor <laughs> around what to do about them. Is there a cure? And the best cure that we seem to have found to date is to learn to ignore them, just like tinnitus, the ringing in the ears. And I 
wanted to think about ways, as I was making this quilt, thinking both about it as a travel diary quilt when I was traveling up north and co-teaching with my friend, as well as trying to cast a spell for myself to not be so bothered by my floaters, uh, which is the equivalent of being cured of my floaters, I would suppose. And so this is Magical Thinking Attempt number seven, is the title of this quilt. The previous quilt pieces in that series were about some hormonal imbalance that I was experiencing and casting a spell to cure that. And so I thought, let me finally cast a spell for a different body part. <laughs> and let me bring you closer because here at a distance, some of the things you can see in connection to the floaters are here this idea of my head as this yellow orb and then I'm surrounded by floaters. But the truth of course is that the floaters are in my eyes, they're not out around me. And then also I've layered a lot of scraps underneath the unbleached white cotton muslin that's the base of this quilt. So it's very opaque, more opaque than the silk organza that I've used. But as you get closer, I think it gives you a sense that the that those scraps are disorienting visually to the viewer. Thinking about that postmodern principle of gazing, they're disorienting to the viewer in the same way that my floaters are disorienting to me. And so as we get closer, you can potentially see some of that embroidery that I did while driving without looking. You can also see some text that I embroidered that says, I'm making friends with, and, and the extension of that would be with my floater, floaters. Uh, it initially said, I'm trying to make friends, but then I thought if I'm manifesting things, I don't want to be forever trying, I want to be actually accomplishing. So I wrote over it in a different color, I'm making friends. And then here, that connection to nature being outside had me very worried about ticks and mosquitoes and things in nature and, and, <laughs> and I wore a very funny mosquito net outfit while I was there that's for sure uh, and and so thinking about how different nature is from eye floaters how can I program into my brain that a floater looks different from a mosquito what is the difference and then how can I again make peace with being outside in nature and, and not being so disturbed by the floaters when I see them. The rabbit is a reoccurring character in my quilts. So this beautiful rabbit is here. It's from a photograph of a rabbit that Zach took that was hanging out by my car. Uh, I've, I find that I've learned a lot about myself by learning about rabbits. And that's a big part of why they show up in my work. This is a scrap quilt and I have an on-demand class that you can purchase on my website if you're interested in learning to make one of these yourself. Scrap quilting for me is an investigation into my habits. I do a lot of mending clothing and when I'm mending that's also an investigation into my habits. So do I repeatedly wear my purse on my right side or my left side? The answer is right side. And you can tell from some of the abrasion that happens on my clothing on the right side or on the right shoulder. Uh, there are a lot of ways of learning about myself, both from mending and clothing, as well as from my scraps, the things that I repeatedly do. For example, there are three of these scrap quilts that I've made so far in this series. And this one has a scrap from that Ikea curtain that's in the piece called There's Something Between Us that I made after the election for Threads of Resistance. And, and so seeing that connection of a, a similar material that now I have to use up because I began cutting up that curtain for that piece. Now the rest of it is here and you can see that lingering and, and continuation of things happening in the piece. There's an element of transparency in this quilt as well. It can be a little challenging to describe, but essentially it's a four layered piece, a four layered quilt. I have the backing, white cotton muslin backing, the batting, and then I have a 
big, big piece that covers everything of navy blue fabric. It happens to be a navy blue fabric that picks up lint like, like you wouldn't believe. So it's not good for me for making clothes or making quilt because it always looks so, so dirty. So this was a way to give it a life, to use it the same way as these scraps are. I'm very happy to be able to use them. And then the white quilt top goes on top the transparent fabrics, for example, I have a scrap of a polyester curtain right here. This is very transparent white fabric, so you can see a lot of the navy blue fabric underneath it. Here you can see a seam in that curtain, and that's where it becomes whiter. Here as well, you can see the seam allowance where there are three layers of fabric instead of one layer. That's where it shines a little whiter and where you don't see as much of the navy blue glowing through. So uh, really exciting, complex, very complex hand piecing in that quilt that gives me a lot of joy to make and is so fun to teach and to see the examples of work that students have made. I, for example, have a Pinterest board for most of my quilt patterns and quilting classes to share the work that students have made and it's a lot of fun to be able to go in and see what do those student scrap quilts look like. Here is the last piece in the exhibition. So we've circled our way around. This is neutrality study number three. Neutrality study number one was more of a black and white and tan quilt. This one I'm thinking a little bit more about in the fashion world, what counts as a neutral? And there are a lot of folks who say that red is a neutral. So wearing red shoes or a red handbag or a red belt fits in with a neutral color palette for clothing. So it felt very fun to me to add red. I also have this rather loud polka dot print at the top. So neutral colors, but maybe not so neutral feeling. Um, this series arose again out of the 2016 election and thinking about the difference between remaining neutral on a subject or taking a stand about it. And for me, I'm attempting neutrality, but then you can see with these ties, this very three-dimensional quilting on the quilt that I've become very, very colorful. So uh, it, it investigates the benefits and minuses of neutrality, thinking about what, what I would be neutral about or not neutral. It also incorporates this wonderful um, table runner uh, on the quilt. This is an embroidery again that I did when I was a high school art teacher. This oops, is some fabric that I dyed naturally with avocado pits and got this very soft, subtle pink. I believe that this base fabric is something that I dyed with coffee. So here you can see it contrasted with the white fabric to see the difference. And <clears throat> I liked that idea as well, that something could be neutral, it could look white, but then when you see it next to white, it doesn't look white anymore. So neutrality study is ongoing. I think I'm about to shift from piecing into quilting neutrality study number five and i find them to be very aesthetically pleasing i love working with neutrals i love wearing neutrals and then also thinking about some of those more conceptual aspects of what does it mean to be neutral um, certainly also perhaps considering some of my swiss heritage i am part swiss and my name's heidi which is of course a very classic swiss story and so wondering about both the benefits and risks of being neutral in that piece. Thank you very much for joining me on this tour, especially if you've made it to the very end. This exhibition will be up through the near the end of August in 2023 this year, so about another month that the show is on display. And it's a beautiful drive here, it's about three hours from my home in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I've had an extraordinary time working with the Woodson Art Museum staff. This is my first solo show in an art museum. <clears throat> I've been in art museums before, I've had solo shows before, but 
never the two together. So I'm very, very grateful to the staff here for including me and uh, just feel so joyful to have this piece here. There's also an exhibition on recology upstairs at the Woodson Art Museum. It's art that was made with the San Francisco dump. And so there's a beautiful connection between the repurposing that happens in my quilts and the repurposing that's happening in that exhibition. My friend, Sherry Linwood, who's a wonderful quilter, very involved as well as me in the Modern Quilt Guild and uh, attends QuiltCon most years. She has a quilt in that Recology exhibition. She's one of many artists, it's a group show. She did that residency. And there was a soft bulk conversation that I had here on my YouTube channel a couple years ago with Luke Haynes and Zach Foster and Sherry Linwood. And she shared quite a bit about that artist residency with us in our conversation. It was a conversation about sustainability. So I would highly recommend that you check out that conversation. Her piece here in this museum is a piece where she used the underarms of shirts and created this beautiful repeating pattern. And one of the things that I've learned, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the most wonderful things that I've learned, and hopefully you can see the impact of it in my work from Sherry Linwood is that she likes to leave evidence of the garment in the resulting work. So she doesn't just cut out the fabric and pretend that it's fresh new yardage, but instead Sherry is a master at cutting things out and using perhaps the shape of an arm or the shape of an inset leg to reveal in the finished quilt where that fabric came from and using that in particular as a storytelling tool so that you can understand it's not fresh brand new yardage but instead it's from something and that it's telling a story and that it's meaningful that it is that particular unique object in the work so um, something that I love having in common with Sherry Linwood, that she very much opened my eyes to and got me excited about. And I hope you'll check out both that softball conversation and the tour that I did of the Seams exhibition with the Portrait Society Gallery back in 2000. Thank you again. Um, please like and subscribe and let me know if you like this tour. I will do my very best to do more tours of other exhibitions that I'm in in the future.